Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another video. Today we're going to talk about an event that topped the list for many storm chasers in 2024, and that is the incredible supercell and tornado that occurred near El Dorado and Duke, Oklahoma on May 23rd. This shape-shifting tornado danced across the Oklahoma countryside for nearly an hour, morphing from a multi-vortex to a large cone to a stunning barrel that provided chasers a dazzling subject to document. Along with the photographs and videos, multiple high-resolution mobile radars were able to capture a wealth of data on the Duke tornado, giving insights into its impressive structure, behavior, and intensity. However, all of this was quite a surprise as the background environment did not appear to support such significant tornadic activity at first glance. In this video, we're going to take a deep dive into the meteorology behind this event in an attempt to figure out how the Duke tornado was able to happen. We'll also dig into some of the mobile radar data that was collected to look for any unique features that this supercell and tornado exhibited. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. The Storm Prediction Center first identified a severe weather risk area for May 23rd in their Day 6 outlook on May 18th. Initially focused on the region from Oklahoma into the Arklatex, the risk area, a level 2 out of 5 slight risk, expanded northward by the first issuance of the Day 2 outlook on May 22nd. The main threat was still expected to focus on the southern plains where a 5% tornado risk contour and 15% hatched area for large to very large hail had been outlined. By the second day two outlook, a level 3 out of 5 enhanced risk had been added across Nebraska and northern Kansas, given increasing confidence in an intense MCS traversing the region. Only slight adjustments were made by the morning outlook on May 23rd, with an enhanced risk surrounded by a broad slight risk that extended into the southern plains. A large 5% tornado risk encompassed southwest Oklahoma, as did a 15% area for damaging winds and a 15% hatched area for large to very large hail. All right, let's dive into the meteorology behind this incredible tornado. We'll begin at 500 millibars at 12Z, 7 a.m. Central Standard Time on May 23rd. Generally, zonal flow was entrenched across most of the U.S., with the exception of this trough centered over the northwest. This would be the main synoptic scale impetus for severe weather in the Nebraska enhanced risk. Farther south, a belt of enhanced 40 to 50 knot flow was centered over Texas, but given the lack of notable waves embedded within the flow, large-scale forcing for ascent appeared to be quite nebulous across the southern plains. This meant we'd have to rely on notable surface features and strong surface heating to initiate convection. As we progressed into the afternoon, we did see perhaps some ripples develop within the flow, including what could be a subtle shortwave draped southward from the eastern Texas panhandle at 21Z. This may have marginally aided in storm development, but we'd still need substantial help from mesoscale features and surface heating. Up at 300 millibars, the pattern was similar with a notable absence of defluence across the southern plains throughout the day, additional evidence of a lack of robust large-scale forcing for ascent in this setup. Down at the surface at 12Z, a low was situated across northeast Wyoming. This was unsurprising given that the main mid-level shortwave and associated jet streak were already beginning to overspread the region to start the day. The surface pattern was much more ill-defined across the southern plains, also to be expected given the overall lack of robust troughing and forcing aloft. With time, the northeast Wyoming surface low migrated off to the east into South Dakota, while a secondary surface low center developed in eastern Colorado. This would have impacts on the surface pattern to the southeast across Oklahoma and Texas. Taking a look at our raw surface data, the surface pattern was somewhat nebulous to start the day. The only clear synoptic feature of note appeared to be a dry line situated across eastern New Mexico and west Texas. Note the extremely dry air and southwesterly winds west of the boundary and moist southerly flow to its east. The dry line was expected to mix east during the day. Rich moisture was in place from southern Oklahoma into much of Texas, with upper 60s dew points across southern Oklahoma, increasing into the low 70s south of the Red River. One of the potential flies in the ointment with this setup was an area of convection that had developed before dawn across the Edwards Plateau in West Texas. Models were in disagreement on how it would progress through the morning. In reality, it increased in size and persisted well into the afternoon across central Texas. Given the southerly to southeasterly surface flow, the question was how much rain-cooled air would be advected north ahead of the dry line and how it would impact the width of the warm sector. However, with rich moisture already entrenched across the region and surface winds veering slightly to more due southerly heading into the afternoon, the area from northwest Texas into southwest Oklahoma was not impacted. Convectively contaminated air was advected into much of north Texas, note the significantly decreased dew points, 
but an appreciably wide warm sector remained ahead of the dry line, which had developed northward, tightened, and mixed east as expected to a position from western Kansas into west Texas ahead of storm initiation. The low-level jet remained below 30 knots throughout the day, which is quite low for significant tornado events. A subtle but fairly negligible increase to near 30 knots occurred by early evening. Let's now take a look at the 12Z observed sounding at Norman, Oklahoma from the morning of the 23rd. Robust instability was already in place with mixed layer cape in excess of 1700 joules per kilogram. This was due in part to a stout elevated mixed layer that was in place as evidenced by the deep layer of very steep lapse rates atop the low level moist layer. The moist layer itself was relatively deep as well, extending to just below 800 millibars. Given the lack of notable synoptic scale forcing for ascent, we'd have to rely heavily on strong surface heating to erode the cap. The convective temperature was a manageable 89 degrees Fahrenheit, meaning that the surface would have to warm to at least 89 degrees Fahrenheit to allow surface parcels to become buoyant and rise on their own. Sure enough, by 19Z, 2 p.m. Central, convective temperatures were breached just ahead of the dry line in northwest Texas, leading to initiation shortly thereafter. On the kinematic side, low-level flow was weak, leading to stunted low-level hodographs despite adequate deep layer shear to support severe storms. Given a lackluster low-level response despite surface low development in eastern Colorado throughout the day, this was not expected to change much, casting doubt on the tornado threat with any storms that would develop. It was evident that any tornadic activity would have to be fueled by mesoscale and storm scale processes. Unsurprisingly, by the next balloon launch at Norman at 20Z, 3 p.m. Central, as storms were initiating, the wind profile had not changed a whole lot with very limited low-level hodograph curvature and a weak low-level jet. Deep layer shear had increased some to over 50 knots thanks to the arrival of slightly stronger flow aloft. Thermodynamically, instability had skyrocketed with mixed layer cape now exceeding 4,000 joules per kilogram. The moist layer had deepened substantially, now extending all the way up to near 700 millibars. All in all, this environment clearly favored robust convection, but the tornado threat, and certainly the significant tornado threat, was much more in question given the unimpressive hodographs. Let's take a closer look at the convective evolution on radar to try to determine how the Duke tornado happened. Storms developed along the dry line just before 4 p.m. and rapidly became supercellular. Straight hodographs favored several storm splits and mergers, and around 5 p.m., a storm initiated just south of the ongoing supercell near Dodson, and the two storms quickly proceeded to interact. As this occurred, the new storm rapidly intensified and became the dominant supercell. A textbook hook echo developed and low-level rotation ramped up significantly north of Hollis, although no tornado was confirmed. To the southwest, another supercell had initiated and was moving toward the Hollis supercell. Just like before, the two storms merged, with the southern updraft becoming dominant and increasing in size as a well-defined hook echo developed. The supercell was initially outflow dominant, as evidenced by the convex, dogleg-esque shape the hook echo takes on, and the region of strong inbounds that surges out ahead of the hook echo. Then, things completely change. The storm, which had been moving east or east-southeast, becomes stationary, the hook echo carves itself out once again, and significant tornado genesis occurs just north of El Dorado around 7 p.m. The tornado was quite intense, meandering southeast before deviating back to the northeast and even west at the end of its life cycle, remaining in progress for nearly an hour. The question is, how did this happen? We've already established the environment was favorable for explosive convection, but the tornado threat appeared to be in question given limited low-level shear. So why did such an intense, long-lasting tornado occur? Let's go through what we know. We know the storm underwent a merger, but this happened about an hour before the Duke tornado began, so it's unlikely the merger had a direct influence on tornado genesis. We also know the storm stalled, and immediately after that happened, tornado genesis occurred. So it appears the storm's sudden change in motion was somehow tied to tornado genesis. How does a supercell just stop moving all of a sudden? It anchors itself to a boundary. This phenomenon isn't all that uncommon. In fact, the Anson and Holly, Texas tornadic supercell back on May 2nd, just a few weeks before the Duke tornado, was a prime example. Although the merger process was slightly different than that of the Duke case, the supercell evolution was similar. A supercell initiated near Hamlin and began meandering east-southeast, while a left split from a storm near Abilene began tracking north toward the developing Hamlin storm. The left split was complete with its own outflow boundary. After the left split merges with the right mover just north of Anson, the new, single, conglomerated supercell latches onto the old left split's outflow boundary and completely stalls, 
producing a tornado just west of town. The same thing happened in the Duke case. Leading up to tornado genesis, a subtle fine line and shear boundary emanating from the mesocyclone region of the storm becomes evident on radar. This may be a manifestation of the supercell's own outflow boundary to which it anchored, but it also appears that there may have been a mesoscale boundary in place. Going back to our raw surface data, notice how a clear wind shift and differential heating boundary develops in extreme southwest Oklahoma. Temperatures to the south of the boundary had soared into the low 90s with due southerly winds, while temperatures to the north had remained in the mid 80s with more backed southeasterly winds. As illustrated in visible satellite imagery, cloud cover had lingered across much of Oklahoma, including the southwest part of the state, well into the afternoon, while an area of clearing had developed in northwest Texas. In addition, there had been extensive convection across southern Oklahoma and far north Texas overnight, which may have left behind an outflow boundary that retreated into the area. In any case, the Duke supercell appears to have latched onto the boundary, which likely featured enhanced vorticity and low-level shear along it. With strong to extreme instability in place, this was easily ingested by the storm once it anchored, inducing significant tornado genesis. Speaking of strong to extreme instability, let's take a look at a series of rap model soundings at Frederick, Oklahoma, around 30 miles southeast of where the supercell and tornado occurred. Starting at 12Z, strong instability was already in place, as we saw on our 12Z observed sounding at Norman. Mixed layer cape was near 2500 joules per kilogram, rooted atop a stout capping inversion. The moist layer wasn't overly deep, extending to just below 850 millibars. All in all, this was a classic loaded gun sounding, representative of an environment supportive of explosive convection that was awaiting an impetus for development. In this case, the warming of the surface to near the 90 degree convective temperature and modest descent from any subtle short waves moving through the area. Deep layer shear was already favorable for organized convection, although low level shear was on the weaker side. As we headed into the afternoon, the surface warmed and moistened and the moist layer deepened slightly. The lifting and cooling of the capping inversion does suggest at least some synoptic scale forcing for ascent, albeit subtle. By storm initiation around 20Z, 3 p.m. Central, the atmosphere was fully uncapped with mixed layer cape approaching an impressive 5,000 joules per kilogram. Low level instability was quite strong as well with 0 to 3 kilometer cape in excess of 140 joules per kilogram. This would aid in the tilting and stretching of vorticity along the differential heating boundary into the vertical to aid in supercell tornado genesis, which would compensate for the lackluster wind profile, at least from a tornado perspective. Deep layer shear had strengthened to near 60 knots, but low level shear had decreased even further, with extremely limited low level hodograph curvature and effective storm relative helicity below 100 meters squared per second squared. Typically, this would support mostly a large hail threat rather than a tornado threat, as well as splitting storms. The highly unstable environment would continue into the late afternoon and early evening, but the low levels would be subjected to some vertical mixing, which caused temperature dew point spreads to rise above the 20 degree Fahrenheit threshold for tornadic activity. As we've discussed before on the channel, vertical mixing occurs with intense surface heating. As air near the surface is efficiently heated, it rises, which brings air up from below, but there's also a complementary transfer of typically drier air downward from aloft, which can allow surface dew points to decrease as surface temperatures rise. This may have explained why the Duke supercell initially struggled with outflow dominance, as a drier low-level environment tends to promote more efficient outflow production in supercells. However, as the evening progressed and surface temperatures cooled slightly, the temperature dew point spread became more manageable, which would have only aided in tornado genesis. Still, low-level shear remained weak with around 80 meters squared per second squared of effective storm relative helicity and a fairly straight hodograph. Again, this was overcome by the strong low-level and deep layer instability that helped the Duke supercell efficiently ingest vorticity from the boundary to aid in tornado genesis in the face of weak low-level shear. The environment in proximity to the Duke tornado was nearly identical to that of the aforementioned Anson Holly, Texas case back on May 2nd. Both events exhibited extremely robust instability with long, straight hodographs featuring very limited low-level shear, but strong upper-level shear. In each case, the main supercell's interaction with a boundary was critical in compensating for the lack of low-level shear. These events prove that supercells in this kind of environment one that might traditionally be overlooked regarding tornado potential, must be watched closely, especially if storm or boundary interactions take place. Finally, the Duke tornado exhibited significant deviant motion, especially in the latter stages of its life. Using the 0Z wrap proximity hodograph at Frederick and the deviant tornado motion technique outlined in Nixon and Allen 2021, we can determine which way tornadoes would be expected to deviate in this environment. We first determine our storm motion, which appeared to be slightly more southeastward than what the bunker's right storm motion dictates, 
so we'll estimate it to be somewhere in here. Next, we find the mean wind in the lowest 500 meters of the atmosphere, which looks to be somewhere in here. We then draw a vector to the midpoint of those two points, and that is our deviant tornado motion vector. You can see that it's pointing nearly due north, which matches well with the observed motion of the tornado toward the end of its life. Several high-resolution mobile radars, including the Doppler on Wheels fleet and the University of Oklahoma's RAXPOL, documented the Duke tornado at relatively close range, revealing some interesting features that the supercell and tornado possessed. First, the tornado was coincident with a well-defined weak echo hole, which looks like a hurricane's eye. It's a small, echo-free area surrounded by more intense reflectivity that's caused by the centrifuging of hydrometeors, i.e. water droplets, outward from the center of the vortex. The weak echo hole was often continuous with height, deeming it a weak echo column. The parent supercell also displayed a phenomenon called a low-reflectivity ribbon. As described in Snyder et al. 2013, a low-reflectivity ribbon is a narrow band of reduced reflectivity extending from near where the hook echo attaches to the main body of the storm near the rear of the forward flank downdraft. While its formation mechanisms and its exact influence on tornadic supercells is unknown, Griffin et al. 2018 found that both decreased theta e, a thermodynamic variable that incorporates temperature and moisture, and increased vertical shear were present within the low-reflectivity ribbon. Both Snyder et al. 2013 and Griffin et al. 2018 hypothesized that the low-reflectivity ribbon may be caused by a preponderance of much smaller raindrops within this corridor relative to surrounding areas, as the increased vertical shear within the low-reflectivity ribbon may induce hydrometeor size sorting that leads to regions of varied drop sizes within the supercell. The Duke tornado also produced a distinct debris signature in correlation coefficient data. A number of debris ejections were observed, as evidenced by the spiral banding emanating from the main tornado debris signature. As we discussed in our videos on the 2013 Moore, Oklahoma EF5 and the Greenfield, Iowa EF4 back on May 21st, debris ejections occur as concentrated surges in the rear flank downdraft infiltrate and move around the ongoing tornado, yielding trails of debris and, in turn, reduced correlation coefficient that protrude from the typically symmetric debris signature. A schematic diagram of this process is given in Curzo et al. 2015, link in the description box below. A satellite tornado developed shortly after the main tornado made its turn back to the northeast. The two vortices appear to rotate around each other, which of course is called the Fujiwara effect, before the satellite tornado merges with the main vortex. After this occurs, the single, conglomerated tornado strengthens, as evidenced by the significant increase in outbounds within the tornado vortex signature. This was quite similar to the behavior of the El Reno Piedmont, Oklahoma EF5 back on May 24, 2011. The ongoing El Reno tornado performed a Fujiwara effect with a secondary tornadic vortex before the two merged, leading to a notable increase in the size and intensity of the conglomerated tornado. So that's going to wrap things up for this video. The Duke tornado was one of the more photogenic and intense tornadoes of the season, and it was a prime example that all high instability environments, even those with limited low-level shear, should be monitored closely for tornado potential, especially if a boundary lurks nearby. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.